ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to bring in our guest for today. Uh, come on in here. Uh, the wonderful Chris Hansen. Good Very good, good, Chris. What's happening? How's Pleasure. Everybody? Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Been good a while. You. You're looking Anytime. well. Really good. Fantastic. Take a seat, right, my well, friend. That's my line, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take a seat. <laughs> yeah, it's always. Oh my God. That will. That you. You made history with that show, and it will always have be a, a right part of, have of a you. Seat yeah. Right over there. Yeah. And exactly. uh, yeah, have a seat over there. It's become yeah. part of uh, pop culture. A little bit. To little uh, bit. do that, but um, now, now I, I've been watching uh, your new show. Yes. And uh, it's fantastic. Well, thank you. It's so compelling. Um, there's something about a show that presents uh, crime and then the criminals involved and gets in there. Why are we so fascinated with the mindset of murderers? Well, I think because we take the viewer into places they wouldn't normally get to go. They see things they wouldn't normally get to see and they hear things they wouldn't normally get to hear. So. When we go into these stories, whether it's a murder case, whether it's Hanson versus Predator, or whether it's, you know, the thing we did last week on the heroin epidemic across the country, we embedded with Montgomery County, Ohio sheriff's investigators near Dayton. Mm -hmm. and we went out after dealers. We went after, uh, we, we talked to people who started, uh, you know, treatment facilities. And we dug deeply into this problem that has got a grip on society like I've never seen before. Yeah, this is something that uh, is a huge issue in this country, yeah. and I don't think it's being addressed uh, as it People should are trying. Be. People they are, are trying, trying. But it's a massive problem, Anthony. I mean, this was a passion project for me, and we saw these investigators go out in an area near Dayton that has more heroin overdoses per capita than any other area in America. Not L.A., not Chicago, not New York. Dayton, Ohio. Are there any theories as to why that is? I-80, I-75, Mexican cartels. They have mm. Mexican cartel members living in Dayton, Ohio, because it's safer than being in Medellin. Oh, my. And they're running. The people from Chicago are coming to Dayton to get the heroin. And how are they getting it over the, the, the border and then up to date? They truck it. They have mules swallow multiple different ways. Amazing. And I, I've heard uh, that, that uh, this problem kind of stemmed from, well, it's always been there uh, to some extent, but it stemmed from the use of, of opiates, uh, legally prescribed, illegally obtained uh, uh, pharmaceuticals that then become too expensive and people actually go to heroin. That's exactly right. So as an alternative. In many cases, kids are either experimenting with pills they find in their parents' medicine cabinet after mm. a surgery that leaves them in pain, or they themselves are injured in an athletic incident. Right. So they get them, they get addicted, they run out of the script, the doctor won't prescribe them anymore. So then they go to a Craigslist, they run out of money, and then they're, they're screwed. So they buy heroin, they snort it, and then they figure out that injecting is much more powerful and efficient than snorting. And it's a common path. In Ohio, for instance, okay, Governor Kasich and his team said, we're gonna eliminate the prescription opioid problem in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And they did such a good job, and it became so hard to get those prescription drugs that a whole wave of people, a generation, businessmen, housewives, high school kids, college kids, went to heroin. Went over to heroin. That was the unintended consequence of cracking down and doing such a good job in controlling right. street mills. You know? Which kind of shows you that uh, legislating against something that people want will open up a black market for those things. It's very, you, you, it seems like you have to look a couple of steps ahead of what you're gonna do to, to prevent that from happening? There's no pro There's no discussion that, that the opioids aren't, you know, a problem and a scourge. And they did a great job. But how do you now handle the heroin? Yeah. We were out on the streets with the uh, task force, and they had a confidential informant waiting for a dealer to deliver heroin. And while she was waiting in the streets, another dealer came by and tossed her a free pack of heroin with the name of it and his number. Oh. So then we bust him. Kid's like 16, 17 years old, slinging heroin in the streets of Dayton, Ohio. Oh my! And you go in his car, and they 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 sell it in capsules for some reason, you know, because it looks like pills instead of actual heroin. Oh right, okay. You know? But and it's so strong now. And then this fentanyl, and the Mexican cartels now are making synthetic fentanyl. It's not even getting them from some prescription source. 
and this is then they're mixing it with heroin. In the in the city of Cincinnati, Ohio, in one two week period, there were 174 overdoses. Wow! Because they're mixing fentanyl with heroin. Yeah. yeah. Years ago, when I was growing up, I mean, you know. Kids would smoke weed. Right. They might, you know, you, you're cramming for a test. You might uh, you use a little, uh, take, a little uh, take a little black beauty, a little you know, speed white, white or cross, something. White cross, a little white Whatever cross. It, yeah, yeah there, were, there were certain drugs that, not that they were accepted, but uh, amongst your you friends around, it was. You could find them, yeah. Part of the rite of passage, I guess you'd say. Heroin was at a line where you wouldn't cross it. Not in a million That was years. where it was the the bum on the street the uh, heroin addict the, the right. it was jazz different. musician who right. has been on for 40 years and regulated it there you yeah. go that's it, it the cast what, corridor in detroit what made it well i think so it accepted. comes back to this it, it happened a little bit in the go-go 90s on wall street you had wall street people buying it recreationally snorting it on the weekends there was a famous case where you know, a husband and wife did it, the wife OD'd and died, and, you know, this young child is in the next room, and he's got to mop all this up, you know. And it was an eye-opener then. It sort of went away for a little bit. But I think it really came from this, this movement from the prescription opioids on into actual heroin use. And mm -hmm. they say that once you do it, you are constantly chasing that first high. You're chasing the dragon. Right. And you'll never get it again. And when you do send somebody into rehab, even if it was the finest, you know, facility in the world, the odds of using again in the next two or three days are astronomical. I mean, people go through two, three, or four times. We interviewed a, a young man in um, New Jersey, and he and his mother started a, a facility right there, and it's, it's amazing. He was in rehab seven times. His mother finally went to go get him. He was in an abandoned hotel room in Palm Springs, California. He wouldn't say where he was. She found out his girlfriend was having her mother come in. She mm. staked out the airport behind a rock, saw the woman come in, jumped in the car, said, take me to my son. Kicks the door open, Rambo style, tough jersey broad. Mm. He's got the spoon drawing into the syringe, to, about to shoot up, drags him out of there, saves him. And when he got out of rehab the seventh time, which actually took hold, wow. she's like, what am I gonna do? So in you know this little town uh, in the Jersey Shore, uh, they had this, you know, beautiful seven-acre horse farm, and they had an after-school playgroup, essentially, for recovering young heroin addicts. And it grew into this amazing treatment facility mm -hmm. that sees wonderful results. When we aired that story last Monday, within an hour of the airing in New York, they had 50 calls from people who wanted in and wanted interventions for the children. Wow. Yeah, th there is a desperation, and yeah. you can see it. Uh, in people and in the response to something like that. Oh, yeah. It's crossing all demographics, right? It's housewives, it's cheerleaders, it's executives, it's, you know, kids in college. And it, it, it's, it's a vexing problem because mm -hmm. it is so addictive. Do you enjoy getting this in-depth into a story? I mean, well, most... yeah, that's, you know, what I like to do. I mean, look, there are stories that, you know, I jump on in one day and we turn them quickly. And mm -hmm. that's part of the business. You know, it's yeah. been that way since... I was a reporter in Lansing, Michigan, 34 years ago. But you know, you turn those around, which are important. They're educational, um, entertaining. But you also have to have five or six back burner stories mm. that will really, you know, kick people's asses and get their attention. Because it's it it gives a story so much more credibility when you've gone through a few layers of it, and when and you, you get talk out, to multiple people, and yeah. especially in this age of fake news, uh, it, it, it's. It's refreshing to see uh, a story that it's not just the surface catchphrase, throw it out there. Well, We're seeing the people involved. We're seeing the results of what happened. We're seeing a follow-up. You know, the longer I'm in this business, the more I get you know, drawn into these stories. Mm -hmm. I'm 57 years old. I don't go to Little League games anymore. My kids are grown, they're gone. I, I basically, you know, I love them, I spend time with them. They're in my business. One works with me, one's a reporter up in uh, Traverse City at the NBC station. But, you know, this is what I do every day. I get up, I think about the stories I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna do them, mm -hmm. and, and with whom I'm gonna do them. And that's, that's what fascinates me. We'll get into, uh, oh boy, uh, I, I love this, uh, this story. Um, it's the one with the, uh, Adams, yeah, Michael, Michael Adams. Oh, God, yeah. Michael Adams' story <laughs> and the spaghetti sauce. <laughs> this is what a, a crazy story. Yeah. But first, I want to kind of get a, a, a line on this 
the, the media, the news these days yes. and, and the controversies, the credibility issue that has popped up since the 18 month long campaign and even before that, for the most part. But it seems during the campaign for the presidency, we saw the media almost completely open up and say, this is who we are. A and they seem to have really lost credibility. Well, it's interesting because the last time I was here on this show, you and I had the Trump discussion. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, I told you that he never thought he'd ever be president. <laughs> you know, he's P.T. Barnum. He was out promoting his brand. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Now he's president. Yeah. So, we, you know, everybody's got to sort out what, what this means and, and what does it mean to America and, and what were the voters saying and, and what's he going to do now? Um, the venerable Bob Schieffer was on, you know, the Sunday morning CBS show talking about it. And he's seen 14, you know, presidents yeah. be inaugurated. And I think he knows as well as most anybody. And, you know, his take on it was, it's fine to go out and say, we want to make America first. We want to put auto workers back on the job in the factories. We want steel plants to be open again. But to get into this isolationist thing raises big questions because our power base is somewhat reliant on the fact that we are present mm -hmm. all around the globe. Sure. And if we're not present all around the globe, we lose that power base. We are no longer the superpower of the world. And so this has to be balanced. I mean, I'm sure, I hope that they all figure it out and, and we're not rumping around about, you know, five to eight million illegal aliens voting in the in the election. I mean, I don't, based upon everything I see, I don't see that that's true. And now they're dancing around about it. So, it, I mean, yeah. it's, it's great fodder for The Daily Show and for Kimmel and for, you know, Fallon and, 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 and everybody else, uh, Steve Colbert. But it, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. I mean, you wake up in the morning sometimes, you, go, you know. I can't believe, I still, this happen? I still I mean, look. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm making a political statement here. No, I'm just no, saying, of course. But you, you can't make up the entire scenario of the 2016 election. Yeah, I look at the news and I see President Donald Trump and I still go, what? <laughs> like, you have to. You, we we all, he we've won. known this guy for 40 some odd years in the public eye. Yeah, no, I've met him. I don't know, know him well, but I mean, I've seen him on the street and said, yeah, yeah. a pleasant guy, but I never thought he was going to be my president. Yeah, and, and then <laughs> he's he's the president. And uh, what, what I see, though, as far as the, the media coverage of it was, uh, I don't, I think everybody underestimated the frustration of a, a large portion of the American public. Well, I agree with that. I mean, when you go, for instance, my, as I said, my youngest son's a reporter for the NBC station up in Traverse City, and he's based in, in Gaylord, Michigan. And you drive through Gaylord, you see a lot of Trump signs. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of mistrust in the political system. Right. And he may be a little out there on some of the policies and what he says, but a lot of people there want to just say, screw it, mm -hmm. blow it up. Maybe he's only there for two to four years, but blow it up because it can't be any worse than what's going on right now. And I think that's the real mindset when you get out of New York City. Yeah, I, I think also uh, the lifetime career politicians are very upset about this because it is kind of exposing them. Uh, you, you don't want a guy, a businessman to come in there and really start uh, doing a lot it just seems like they've been they've had a system in yeah, place i agree and this guy doesn't play by the same rules no. and it might expose what they've been doing that perhaps the american people wouldn't like i just wish he'd use more than the 45 words he uses in every speech <laughs> i know he's smarter than that <laughs> I, I, you know what yeah. i mean as a guy who writes as a guy who's you know kind of a wordsmith or at least in my own mind you know it shouldn't always be great or excellent i mean just just Somebody should be advising him to say, let's take it out of that limited vocabulary. I'm, I'm wondering how this will progress with him as president, if things like that will happen over time, or well, if he knows, so. like P.T. Barnum, he knows what works. Well, give him the elephants, give him the dancing yeah. bears. That's what they like. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what they like. Sometimes you can't overestimate your audience. No, 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 <laughs> no not at all. Uh, and uh, this, I, oh boy. This, these stories that you cover, these these real murders, horrible, horrific crimes. You can't write a movie script any better than this one or no. so many of the others we have coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. We uh, we have this horrific murder 
Uh, I guess you have uh, Mike Adams. He is um, he is a fiance. On again, off again. On again, off again, uh, fiance. Uh, he murdered uh, Nicole Ledger. Yeah. Uh, and, and this started off with some spilt spaghetti sauce. <laughs> this guy was OCDC. Oh, and boy. Such a freak that when this happened, it so freaked him out that he ended up actually poisoning wow. a future batch of spaghetti. And, and this guy is accused of this and is allowed on on bail and then ends up committing the murder. So, I mean, look, oh. how much do you have to do? to stay in jail and, and wow. not be so deemed a danger he's, to her or the rest of society. He's plotting the murder. Yes. He gets arrested. Yes. They let him out on bail, and he does the exact murder and he, he kills her. plotting. And who's taking the fall for this? Who's, well, we're, who's we're, the, you'll see in the story yeah. that, that uh, Michelle Sagona does, who's a great correspondent, uh, one of many working for the show, that you'll see that, you know, we interview, you know, uh, one of her children, and, and we, we take it to the limit, and, and we go after the people to hold them accountable, as mm -hmm. we do in every story. I mean, we had last week a story of a young woman who was savagely raped by her stepfather for four years. This guy was an ex-cop. This happened in Michigan, Roosevelt, Michigan. And finally, she gets the courage to tape a conversation where she proclaims to be pregnant and she's going to tell her mom and he lays it all out there and it's very incriminating. Goes to the state police, she has another tape with him, they prosecute him, he pleads guilty and gets two 40-year sentences. Mm -hmm. He comes up for parole twice. She is notified, she testifies at the hearings, he goes back in. The third time, they want to get this guy out. They're trying to clear the space in the, in the prison system. And he's admitted that he's still a problem. He's still interested in young girls, and he, he has not come clean on this thing. Still claims that this relationship was consensual, even though it lasted from the age of 11 to, to 14. Jeez. So the parole board in Michigan releases him without notifying the stepdaughter, Tiffany. So she's at a traffic light last Easter Sunday and looks to the left and sees this guy, Oof. Richard McBrayer. That's movie so stuff she, right she there. Gets, she gets, so we do the story. So wow. she, she gets the lawyer. She looks up the lawyer who used to work for the prosecutor's office in Macomb County, Michigan. She's now in private practice. She takes a case pro bono. This guy goes back in jail, and we find out that he's back out again. So we're going to do a follow-up for, you know, the next week. And again... And then you've got the, another guy. I don't know if you know this case of Richard Worsley Jr., White Boy Rick, a case I covered a million years ago when I was a reporter in Detroit. So here's a guy, a nonviolent offender, arrested at 17 for f four kilos of cocaine. Under the law at the time, he got mandatory minimum life. <laughs> wow. Uh, so he's still in the can, and they're busting their ass to let this guy out, who's a convicted rapist. Why? And this guy carried a box of cocaine across the street, and maybe he did worse things than that. But it's, it's time. Get him out of there. Why so for political reasons, they won't let Worshi out, but this guy, they can't get him out fast enough. What's with the, why would they be, be protected? I, I will be asking those very out. questions in about a week to 10 days. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm seeing that on Crime Watch Daily. It's, yeah, Crime Watch Daily. Um, here in New York, uh, uh, WPIX? PIX 11 yeah. at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Yeah. We're I, in uh, 208 markets across the country. Yeah, I've uh, I've bumped in, bumped into it a few times, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, it's good got to stop. Like it. It's like, oh, okay, because yeah. the stories are fascinating. It's done so well. It's a great team. Look, Warner yes. Brothers, Telepix, Telepictures, I mean, they, they, these guys know how to put on a show. Yeah. And and we do it. And then we have Hanson versus Predator, which is a you know signature investigative franchise. So, uh, Yeah, all, yeah. That, uh, there have been uh, so many memorable yeah. clips from uh, your your Predator series uh, uh, beforehand, the the new show that you have, uh, Hanson vs. Predator. Um, and uh, it's just, it, it never gets old. Seeing those men come in and be confronted by you, it's so compelling. And uh, it's so, do, do, have you ever thought about what the what the attraction is to watching that? Well, I think it's a combination of things. One, you know, we've infiltrated a crime that everybody is concerned about. Um, you see this confluence of somebody trying to do something very evil to a child 
being held accountable mm -hmm. and then either confessing their sins, lying their tail off, or bolting, you know, yeah. like a scared animal. Yeah. So whatever happens, it's the only time people are actually going to be able to see it on TV. Yeah, it's, it, it's so, um, again, compelling to, to watch in this almost voyeuristic way something that could happen uh, but you would Something never be privy to it. You would never be, you would never be able to watch no, that scene no, no, no. taking place, never. even though it could be taking place right now. Unfortunately, it without is, you there, it is taking place right yeah, now. Without you, I can you predict there. without fear of contradiction, it's taking place right now. It's taking place right yes, now. Absolutely. And you're not there to I'm say, there. "Hey." And this gives us an insight into this predatory behavior. Yeah. Uh, and imagine this: when we first started doing those investigations. We merely use decoys in chat rooms on AOL and Yahoo. Mm -hmm. well, today, there's Badu and Kick and Whisper and all these other places. Oh wow! Yeah. And so it's 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 virtually limitless as to platforms where adults, potential predators, can approach children. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to the smartphone. I mean, I used to say just you know keep your kids off the computer. After oh right, yeah. Day. That's that that horse has left the barn. Now they have access to. Now it's keep where, your, regardless keep of where your smartphone are. on the family charger at night and not on the bedstand. It's really tough, isn't it, to yeah. be to be a big Again, my, my guys are you know older; they're twenty five and twenty two, so yeah. I'm out of the woods there. But you know, for somebody who's got a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year old, and it's not just the predators; it's the bullying thing, mm -hmm. which is a big problem. And you've got kids who you know, get teased about breaking up with a girlfriend or doing something or they're trying to come out as being transgender or gay or whatever, and suddenly they're hanging themselves because... We just had another just, story today. Yeah. Uh, a teenage girl, uh, yeah, 14 years old, hung herself <laughs> live, a life. live on uh, Facebook. Yeah, that, that, here's the girl. She was uh, <laughs> in Miami, hung herself live. I, I can't imagine what would drive someone to do that and then want to broadcast it like that as a I mean it's obviously not a cry for help because well, she did it I mean you know I'm not a psychiatrist I just play one on TV but I mean you gotta really be I mean, we never thought about I mean I don't when I was a kid I mean I remember one kid in junior high who OD'd you know putting aerosol up his nose but I can't remember anybody in my entire junior high high school experience who killed themselves yeah and technology is you know part of that you can't yeah. blame technology, but it is it escalates things to a level that we didn't have growing up. The bullying has a much uh, longer reach uh, these it's days. Endless. It's endless. Uh, and, you know, it used to be, hey, you go to school, there's the bully, and he can be confronted. Right. Uh, you know who he is. There's so much anonymity out there at this point, and uh, we kind of forget how vulnerable a lot of these teens it was are a lot about simpler there. in in 1969 when the bully bothered me at the bus stop and my dad said, "Well, just hit him," and I hit, hit him, him. and he threw up and he never bullied me again. <laughs> right yeah, the bus stop is done. You know, what advice we got from our dads? Because my dad said the same thing. Just hit him in the stomach. Just like hit him in the middle. You know, if he's too big to hit, he goes grab the biggest thing you have around and hit him with it. Yeah, it was. I grew up in Detroit. There's no such thing as a fair, you know. Oh my a, God, a fair fight. You know. Yeah, yeah. You just do what you got to do. And that was sound advice. Uh, yeah, by a dad back then. Oh, it's way more complicated I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah yeah the uh again the anonymity really plays a part in this because there's no accountability there doesn't seem to be something that has a conscience that is doing this bullying it's this unknown entity driving somebody to pain and sometimes pain strong enough to want uh, make them want to kill themselves it's anonymity it's access and it's it's the addictive nature of it i mean you know and i know i mean i've got this out now constant I mean, I get people looking for me, you know, an hour from now to go do the tracks for tomorrow's show, right. you know, the retracks. So, you know, we, we get hooked on it. And I think one of the things is that in our day, if you're going to say something to somebody, you had to say it face to face yeah. or find the family telephone and take the princess with the long cord around the corner to talk. <laughs> shut Today, the door. yeah, shut the door and do the whole thing. Today, people say things they wouldn't say face to face and they become acceptable mm -hmm. because there's this you know, depersonalization of, of, you know, conversation online. And so you would never say half that stuff face to face. Never. As a kid. You know why? Also, because there, there would be 
consequences. To yes. That. You would you would have to you might get hit. You wouldn't have the guts to say it. First you of all, wouldn't have the guts. You're well, right. You wouldn't have just, the guts be, to be say offensive, it. You know, there's this lack of conscious like uh, or conscience that that is that goes hand in hand with this electronic communication. There is no accountability. Where does this, uh, for lack of a better word, meanness? come from i don't remember even though you had to be face to face right. and there was accountability right. it just didn't seem like people had it in them to be that mean to want to drive someone to literally kill themselves now with electronic communication social media there seems to be this just underlying meanness that's come out well i think it develops because partially of the anonymity and that people you know don't think that there are any consequences for what they say yeah. And it, it, it escalates. It's just like we see in the Predator investigations. I mean, you know, they say one thing, they get a response, they say another thing, and all of a sudden, you know, they can't live without this face-to-face -face fulfillment of the fantasy after having this go, you know, online in live time. Right. Yeah. Oh, boy, when, they, when, the, when the jig is up yeah. and uh, you come out... Oh, you know, we used to, as, as I was growing up, when, when Alan Funt would walk out mm. and point out the cameras. Great TV, great TV. That was the kicker. Yeah. And you'd be like, ah, and the person would be, you know, the response from the person, which if, if it was Alan Funt coming out is yeah. laughter and, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. God, oh I... <laughs> well, I remember the one, they, they rolled a car down the hill without an engine in it. Oh, yeah. And they pulled into the service station, the garage. They said, you know, it was an attractive yeah. girl, yeah, right? Yeah, attractive girl like, said, hey, my, my car doesn't work. And the guy opens it up, there's no engine there. No engine. And he just, they, they did it over and over again at different garages. And it was one of the best bits ever. On, <laughs> he on, could on not television. fathom why yeah. this car had no engine. Yeah. And, uh, but boy, what a different response. Uh, but we still, there's something about it. Even though it's such a heinous act that this person was coming over to commit, there's this, yeah, it's a gotcha thing. You feel like you're in it. And in on it. Well, we bring you into the room, you know. Yeah. I mean, you see the guy who walks in who's an insurance executive from Boston who has driven three hours to Fairfield, Connecticut to meet a 13-year-old girl for whom he's drawn up a marriage contract, which he thinks is going to get him off the hook if he does have a sexual liaison with her. And he stops for pizza. And his nervous reaction is to eat the pizza while I'm doing the interview with him. He even offers <laughs> oh, me a my service, God. Right? Plan of pizza. And I said, no, I'm good. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, and then, you know, he goes, the crew comes out and he offers them pizza and no thanks. And he's taken away and arrested. And uh, have you had people that the second you walk out, they know you? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, it's over. What is that like when they know well, you who you are? You see the head go down, you know, and just. And I, you know, go through the questions and I said, well, you know what this is about, right? Yes, I do. We know what's going to happen next. And one guy in the last investigation just put his hands. Just up. put his hands back. Yeah, he knew it was it was Off done. You Off you go. You ask them sometimes when they do know, you know like uh, when they say, oh, "I've watched your show. I have seen it." And then you always you say, "Well, then why are you here?" Yeah, you know I'm out here doing this. Why are you doing? And it's not it? just me. Police uh, departments and federal uh, law enforcement agencies do this routinely across mm -hmm. the country. This is not a new thing. But what it does show you is that, you know, the problem has only gotten potentially worse with the explosion of different social platforms. Mm -hmm. And it just, there's more availability out there and more access. And we had a guy in the last one, I mean, this guy was a uh, a fellow I had ridden the tr commuter train with between Connecticut and New York. Yes, I read about this and, one. And, um, I walk out. I didn't recognize him at first. hadn't seen him in a couple of years. And he says, Chris, no, it's not what it looks like. No, no. And the crew just thinks he knows me from TV. From TV, right. And uh, he bolts and, and um, tells the cops later, he said, well, you know, I didn't have my glasses on. So I, I thought when he said 13, it was 18. He said, well, you didn't have your glasses on when you saw the address. You read that just fine. <laughs> <from the> street, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's uh, like I said, it, it's so c compelling to watch and uh you 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 do such a great job with the uh, with these programs, and um, I've got a good team. You know yeah. this and Killer Instinct, which uh, we're yes. going into the third season on. We start shooting that. In fact, I got to go meet with my uh, London uh, broadcast ITN partners next week, and and uh, we've got a lot of great shows coming up. So it's going to be busy. You have uh, Elizabeth Smart on the team. She's great. I tell you what, you know, and obviously we all followed that story sure. when she was missing for nine months. You know, at the what age a of huge 14. story. And when you sit down with her, 
and she's so brutally honest about what happened to her and what these animals did to her. And here's a woman, a young woman from a Mormon family, never drank, never had coffee, obviously never experimented sexually at that young age. Mm -hmm. And she will tell you what they did to her, what they forced her through. And it would be easy to give up and just kill yourself. Wow, and she yeah. got through it by, because of her faith. And I'm not advocating any religion here, but she, I think her faith got her through this. Mm -hmm. And her knowledge that she was way younger than them, and at some point they would die and she'd be free. That's wow. Now, that was the long, that, the long solution of the whole thing? That was her mindset. Well, 14 years old. I mean, how wow. do you process this? Right. And then you're screaming and your parents don't hear you through no fault of their own. And she'll tell the story about how she heard her uncle's voice within, you know, a matter of yards from where she was being held. When oh, the search party was wow. out there. And it, was a, it, it wasn't an easy place to reach. And, and camera crews have been up there will tell you that it's kicked their ass just getting to that area where it happened. I mean, for wow. search parties to even get there was tough. So that's why they got away with this for so long. And then the fear and the shame, will my family accept me back again? But to see her today, you know, the mother of a young child, married happily, close with her family, living in Utah, and going out and doing stories that mm -hmm. represent justice for other victims of this kind of violence and brutality, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have her a part of the show. Yeah, she's very uh, poised. She's yeah. uh, just a, a, a very classy uh, woman, and to have gone through all that and come out the other end I, of it I, even I, functional. I think, I, exactly, and I think that, that uh, there would be an argument that a lot of people who went through that would just say, the hell with it, I'm getting into heroin, I'm killing myself. Right, I yeah. This. I mean, there are people that have gone through a hell of a lot less that yeah. are uh, incapable no, I, I'm, of I'm, I, I cannot a human. find the words to describe how big a fan I am of yeah. on every level. Uh, what does that fulfill something in people that you've spoken to? Like John Walsh is a good example yep. of somebody that took good tragedy guy. and yep. just th their whole life becomes this drive to to help people that have been through similar things. That has to help. I think it does. Um, you know, remember John Walsh when they were searching for Adam. You know, they looked all over he and his wife's record and mm -hmm. investigated, and they were looked at as suspects. And they had nothing to do with it. It was one of those horrifying kidnappings by a sick and depraved criminal. And one of my cameramen, when I worked in Florida, was on the scene when they found his head floating in the canal in Florida, wow. West Palm Beach. And, you know, I, I think I could survive almost anything, but the loss of a child, oh, especially maybe not, maybe, so, maybe not so much. Violently. And so, you know, I'm sure it was horrifying. And I've talked to John many times over the years. But, you know, he channeled his energies into his shows and his the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which does an amazing job. And, and I'm very close with a lot of people on the board there and, and have worked with them many times over the years. And they just, you know, they just do a really solid job. And so I think that's how people survive it in some cases. Do you, do you make these uh, sometimes rush to judgment when you see a, a case that isn't solved yet and it's following such a what would you call typical trajectory trajectory yeah. that you go, it's him. It's got to be him. Well, or you use more of that. I try to journalistic. Hey. I try to I try to use the lessons I learned as a young reporter in Detroit, where I was ensconced in the homicide division of the DPD and narcotics division. And say, you know, if you exclude all other possibilities to the intense focus of one, you may blow the case. Mm -hmm. So, and I've seen it. I mean, look at Richard Jewell and the, you know, Atlanta bombing, Olympic bombing. Yeah. I mean, people were convinced that it he did him, it. It was him. But it wasn't him. It wasn't him, yeah. And he got a lot of checks. Yeah. It has to be more than frustrating, doesn't even cover it, to be accused or at oh. least suspected in a, a crime against a loved one right. when you didn't do it. And here, the guy who ended up doing it, who they caught in the woods of West Virginia, was a you know, crazy anti-abortion guy who somehow thought that it was okay to bomb, right. you know, uh, the park in the Olympics uh, to make his point about abortion. There are certain instances where you'll see uh, a story about a, a violent crime and someone's killed and it really does just point to one person that does end up being the person. Yes, that's true. And I think, I think you know, people who are trained investigators have a certain gut Right. But you look at this case of this poor kid from Stanford, Connecticut, who was stabbed to death in the New York apartment, 
and just kind of at the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, the cops know who did it. They have him in custody, but they're taking their time to make the case to make sure it sticks mm -hmm. because it, you know, kind of came together in a funky way and, you know, they just want to make sure they do the right job. I mean, the one that confounds me, quite honestly, and it was one of the first big investigations we did for Crime Watch Daily is the Karina Vitrano, the jogger in Queens. And oh, okay. my heart yeah. so goes out to Phil and his wife, Kathy, and I've interviewed him, and, and, you know, we had a lot of access to that case and got that exclusive video of the last moments of her life. But it, it, it's really a mystery. They, they've tossed her computer. They've gone through, you know, her life. Her, she had a lot of social media postings, very active blogger, put out, you know, party pictures, very attractive girl. You could see how somebody could become obsessed with her. Mm -hmm. But they're stumped. It's that randomness sometimes, I well, guess. Well, I, I think it, I mean, you go back there and you look where she was jogging. It's, you know, it's pretty isolated. But people who live in that area mm. went back there all the time. They don't, they don't think anything of it. That's just yeah. kind of their, their playground. I would assume that's got to be one of the hardest. If, it, if you do have a completely random killing, yeah. that has to be one of the hardest ones to, to solve as an investigator. And, you know, you're talking about the NYPD, which arguably is, you know, one of the finest right. law and enforcement agencies in the resources. world. Resources. I mean, the Second resources. I mean, you go into the commissioner's office and his, you, into the video surveillance room, you know, give me 38th and 3rd. Right. It's on the yeah, screen. It's there. Like I mean, you know, when O'Neill wants that up, he gets it up. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, yeah. It's right there. And it, it's, it's a really good sharp group of people and you 38,000 sworn officers mm -hmm. you know it's only 8 million people power, yeah yeah 8 million people yeah so they got to be on their game every day but yeah. this this one is vexing and I, I hope they solve it for the mm. sake of the family um and there's just nothing they have no not that i know of and i need to make wow. some phone calls but up until <laughs> the you know the law enforcement christmas parties when i was talking to the all the folks involved that they still were they thought they had something a few weeks back I mean, a few months back, and it just it didn't pan out. So now mm -hmm. they're talking about doing this extended, you know, DNA testing to see if it could be a relative of somebody because they have touch DNA. <coughs> excuse me, they have touch DNA on her neck. Have it on her phone, and um, have it on one other spot, and they just can't link it to anybody. Yeah, no match. <coughs> wow. So it's either somebody probably who was either never been convicted of a crime, or who was convicted. You know, before you know, 1999 when right, they started the database. Right, they had it all in the database. Right. You ever, you ever get more personally attached to one story than another? Oh, I do. I yeah. do. Um, you know, the the case of the Joy Kamenali from Stanford. You know, I have a home in Stanford. Dad's a great guy. You <coughs> some water? Yeah, let me grab some more. Oh, I didn't. Uh... I don't think I... Yeah, I didn't open this. I think this happened <laughs> the last time I was on your show. So. <laughs> Flying off a little bit of a cold. Thanks. That's all right. So, it's a Saturday, and uh, we go over there to do the interview. He's granted us access. I said, listen, I'm sorry for your loss. <clears throat> Kid was 28 years old, close to my kid's age. Mm -hmm. Same town. Knew a lot of the same people. And I, But I'm holding together. You know, I'm okay with it. And I see... We're sitting down to start the interview. I see the corner of my eye, the mother, in the foyer. And I go over there to pay my respects and say hello. And I give her a hug. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sally. I give her a hug, and she starts heaving, crying. Oh, wow. Chest. So I'm shot. So i got to pull together, get the eye drops. To have the, and so now I'm in this interview with the father, and it really, for every reason, just, you know, tore me apart. Wow. But I just, I just, I just, I was wiped out. That's, uh, and you know, yeah. I, what am I wiped out for? I'm just the guy who's asking the question. These people lost their son. That's for no good reason. For no good tough. reason. Right. Some yeah. little schmuck allegedly stabs him, you know, multiple times over what goofy nonsense could it be? Or, yeah, nothing. Yeah. Uh, do, has it, has it, Giving you any less faith in humanity, covering so many horrible well, crimes? Are you jaded or? Yeah, I mean, somebody asked me. I was at the um, Television Critics Association a, a few years back when we premiered uh, Killer Instinct. And uh, a guy from Gannett who'd covered me for 30-some years said, 
you know, do you ever go to therapy to deal with all this darkness? I said, <laughs> I've got it all capped off right here. I don't want to, <laughs> I do not want to explore that. I don't want to go that yeah, deep. Yeah. I don't want to know what drives me. I don't want, you know, I just, I'm, I, you know, I'm analytical when it comes to investigative reporting, but right. I don't want to know that much stuff about myself. It's easier to just keep cruising <laughs> yeah. along, you know. Because you wonder Nothing good is down there, you know. You wonder sometimes if the things you, you see and, and, not trying to make it sound like no, you've been I on know. the battlefield or anything, no, but just no. the, the seeing or hearing about or talking about such just horrible things, you think sometimes, God, it's got to be affecting well, me in some way. Yeah, but probably if you don't so. want to explore it. No, I don't want to explore it. <laughs> what, 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 there's nothing good that's going to come from that. That's exactly. No, I, I, I'll, I'll ski down a mountain, right. play a game of tennis. I'll drive a boat. I'll catch a fish. Physically, I'll go to the saloon, have a get few. Get it out I, there. You know, I don't. You know, I'll go for a run. You know? <laughs> it's from. But the I just, I really, I don't care. Cool as me. And and a very dear friend of mine, professionally and personally, is a is a psychologist, lawyer in, in uh, Arizona, and she's always on me to you know you may want to you know talk to somebody about some of this stuff. And I said, yeah, I just you know I respect your craft. I really do, and it's important. But well, that's not my thing. It's never going to happen. Right. That's not going to happen. Unless it's, <laughs> it's court ordered happen. or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I'm from the same school of thought. It's like, I, I, put it down there. I'm not saying it's healthy. I'm just right. saying that's how I cope with it. That's how I but do I, it. You have to compartmentalize it, you know? But, yeah. I, you know, I... I think there are certain jobs for certain people. That's yes. how it works. You're able right. to see and talk to and deal with people that are literal monsters. They're literally yeah. monsters on Earth and walk away from it. Now, obviously you're a human being, it's gonna affect you in some way, but there are people that would be well, so The Kamen Ali interview tore me up. I mean, I was in tears, I was a mess, and actually this, this friend of mine who's the uh, lawyer psychologist, you know, texted me after, he said, you okay? You I said, I'm, I, I, said I, I, I know it seemed like an overreaction, but I mean, it just caught my heartstring right yeah. at the right moment, you know? And as a dad, as a dad in the same town, uh, with the kids, about the same age, I mean, it just it just ripped me mm -hmm. up. Now again, I, I'm just a reporter. I'm not the one who had to bury the kid. Right. You know, that's yeah. the hard job. And he held it together better than I did. Yeah, I mean, some people, obviously, if they're family members and stuff, they have to deal with that grief, and right. it's just gotta be unimaginable. Um, but yeah, d some people would be devastated to the point of never being able to sleep or deal with people or have a, a well, I still a call. I, I still again. call a lot of these. I mean, I check in all the time, you know, mm -hmm. not for the scoop aspect of it. I mean, obviously, as a responsible journalist, you do that. Sure. But most I just want to say, hey, this wasn't a what hit and wonder. I didn't come into your living room to get a scoop and run off. I mean, right. how you doing? And we're in Florida. Let's go grab a beer sometime. Well, well great. I, right, you know, right. I'm happy to do that, you know. You ever, uh, you ever just want to haul off and punch? Oh yeah, some of these people yeah. that have yeah. done horrible things. Yeah, but that, what does that do? Yeah, I mean the same reason. You know, I've had people tell me, you know, for years, you, know, you should have a concealed weapons permit, and carry a gun. I'm gonna carry a gun. What am I gonna do with a gun? I mean, I, I respect it. Yeah, but, I don't mind target shooting, but nothing good is gonna happen uh, from a journalist carrying a gun. Just because of a journalist carrying a gun? Well, or, yeah, but it or, gives you an option you can't use as a journalist. You can't. You can't do it. Well, self-defense-wise? Well, I think it was in the home, but I still think... Okay. And I'm not advocating guns or versus not guns, but sure. But I still think the best security at home is an alarm system and a dog or two. A dog? I mean, it's, it's just... It's just yeah, yeah. Nobody's going to mess with you, you know? That is true. You know, a lot of... Uh, we, uh, you find out through statistics a lot of criminals uh, want the path of least resistance. Well, most break-ins are door rattling. Just, yeah. If it opens and they if don't see opens. anybody, they will grab whatever's closest right. and they run I usually off. read that came in through an open door, yeah. an open yeah, window, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Exactly. Keep your place sealed up tight and and that's uh, Flip the that's switch. it. Do you, uh, do you keep your head on a swivel more than you would? I you do sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I know the city pretty well and I, I'm confident in most cities across America and many across the world. So, you know, whether it's, I've been in you know, Sierra Leone and yeah. all around India and, you know, doing kind of edgy stories as well as Detroit and New you York. You do and, stand uh, out. I got to say, I remember I, I bumped into you, I think it was like 48th in Madison. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, I saw you from like a block away and it's like, oh, there's Chris Hansen. Yeah. <laughs> so you do, you do stand out. Well, it freaks people out in the grocery line, you know, because it's, you know, it, it, and even if I got a ball cap and I'm unshaven and right. I can pass not being recognized physically, yeah. the voice, the voice usually, gives it yeah, away in, in, a, in yeah. a second. Yeah, it, it does. <laughs> um, 
Before uh, we uh, move on, Chris Hansen, at Chris Hansen on uh, Twitter. Absolutely. Uh, at Hansen V Predator. And uh, Crime Watch Daily with Chris Hansen. It's fantastic. It's Thanks. such a compelling show. You just did your 100th episode. We did. We did. I put a piece of the, the cake out there on the, on the Twitter, and, and uh, it was fun. It's, I tell you, it's from the director of photography to you know, the producers, to the executive producers in L.A., to everybody involved in the show, it really, they make it a pleasure to do. It's well done, and to have you... At, at the helm of it, it uh, you're so good with these stories. It, 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 you, it doesn't seem like you've just been handed some copy to read. Like, you are involved. Well, I irritate the writers, too. You, you, <laughs> do you irritate the writers with that? Well, it's a lot of volume of copy. I mean, imagine, you know, as it turns out, this five-day-a-week thing is, is hard work. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's an hour a day. You know? <laughs> so you got to be on your toes, you know. But it's, yeah. it's, and then you travel. You know, for the for the stories. Yeah. So I'm going to get on a plane tomorrow, and go do you know whatever I'm going to do you know and, and drag it back for next week. Yeah. But you could tell it's not just this figurehead reading about us. No, story. I, I'm I'm into it. And I'm there's so it. many shows yeah. like that where oh this guy's you know right. he doesn't know. Well, that's why we're on the street. I mean, you know, we are inside. You know, for for the winter, we're you know right at the Renaissance Hotel, looking out over Times Square. But you know, when it's not inclement weather, mm -hmm. we're on the street. At you know Fifty Third and Broadway, yeah. So we have all kinds of people that come by. This doctor named Max, who lives up the street, has his two dogs, Hershey and Cadbury. And Hershey's back legs don't work, so he's got this sort of wheelchair thing. So it's the official, you know, oh, poor thing. <laughs> official, you know, hurt dog of crime. Watch. <laughs> they come up every day. We're out there, and we feed them. And Cadbury sees the lights and knows she's going to get fed. And she comes galloping up the street. This dog with this huge head. I mean, just every day is just this crazy experience with you know people coming by and you know hello and you know it, it's 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 a lot of fun. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good show and it does. It seems it's like very fulfilling you're, to do. You're enjoying it. You yeah, enjoy what you do. Uh, I I love talking to you about these. Well, I appreciate things, it. Right? I love being here. It's yeah. so fantastic. CrimeWatchDaily.com and. Uh, Check your local listings. Here in New York, it's uh, WPIX uh, New York. And uh, like I said, it's fantastic. Chris, thanks so well, much. Thanks, buddy. Anytime. You know, no, I that's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a treat. And I enjoy watching it. you. Yeah. Uh, right. Continued success. We'll and uh, good luck. All Take right. care, Chris. Uh, love. Chris Hansen.